Hidden Figures, The True Story of Four Black Women and the Space Race, by Margot Lee Shetlery, with Winifred Conkling, and illustrated by Laura Freeman. Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Christine Darden were good at math. Really good. In 1943, the United States was at war. World War II, Dorothy Vaughn wanted to serve her country by working for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the government agency that designed airplanes. Having the best airplanes would help America win the war. Making airplanes fly faster and higher and safer meant doing lots of tests at the agency's Langley Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia. That is very close to us, like 20, 30 minutes away. Tests meant numbers. Numbers meant math. And math meant computers. Today we think of computers as machines, but in the 1940s, computers were actual people like Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, and Christine. Their job was to do math. Because Dorothy was black and a woman, some people thought it would be impossible for her to get a job as a computer. She lived in Virginia, a southern state, where laws segregated or kept apart black people and white people. They could not eat in the same restaurants. They could not drink from the same water fountains. They could not use the same restrooms. They could not attend the same schools. They could not play on the same sports teams. They could not sit near each other in movie theaters. They could not marry someone of a different race. But Dorothy didn't think it was impossible. She was good at math, really good. She knew she was the right person for the job. She applied and the laboratory offered her a position as a computer. At work, blacks and whites were kept apart. The white computers worked in one building and Dorothy and the other black computers worked in a different building, in their separate office. Even though they worked on the same kinds of assignments, the black computers and white computers used separate bathrooms and ate in separate lunchrooms. America won the war in 1945, but Dorothy stayed on the job, still trying to make airplanes faster and safer. By 1951, the Americans and the Russians were competing to see who could build the best planes. That meant more experiments and more numbers. Lots and lots of numbers. And more numbers meant the need for more computers. That's when Mary Jackson got a job as a computer at Langley. She worked in a group that tested model airplanes in wind tunnels. A wind tunnel was a machine like a huge metal box with a powerful fan attached. Mary put model planes in the wind tunnel and blasted them with air from the fan. This experiment helped her group improve their designs on the models before building full-size planes. Mary wanted to become an engineer, but officials said it was impossible. Most of the engineers at the laboratory were men. And to become an engineer, Mary needed to take high-level math classes but she wasn't allowed to go inside the white school where the classes were taught. But Mary was good at math, really good, and she refused to give up. She got permission to enter the school building and take the math classes, and she earned good grades. Because she didn't give up, Mary Jackson became the first African-American female engineer at the laboratory. Katherine Johnson was good at math and always asked lots of questions. In 1953, she applied to the laboratory for a computer job and was placed on a team that tested actual planes while they were flying in the air. Their research was used to figure out ways to prevent future plane crashes. In one of her first projects, she learned how to analyze turbulence or dangerous gusts of wind of air. No one knows how many lives her work may have helped save. Catherine wanted to help the group prepare its research reports, so she asked if she could go to meetings with the other experts on her team. Her boss told her it was impossible. These women keep that being told that it's impossible. Let's see what happens. Women aren't allowed to attend meetings, he said, but Catherine knew she was as good at math as anyone else, maybe better. So she asked him again, and again, and again, Catherine asked her boss so many times that he finally invited her to the meetings. Catherine was good at math, really good. And because she fought to be treated the same as the men, 
She became the first woman in her group to sign her name to one of the group's reports. In the 1950s, the Langley Laboratory bought, bought a machine computer that could do math faster than the human computers. At first, these machines made mistakes. Dorothy learned how to program the machines so that they got the right answers. She taught the women in her group how to program their computers, too. In 1957, Russia launched a satellite known as Sputnik into orbit around the Earth. The United States started building satellites to explore space, too. For years, the laboratory had used math to design airplanes. Now it would need math to create spaceships as well. The government decided to change the agency's name from the National Advisory Committed Committee for Aeronautics to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy told Congress, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. A man on the moon? But the first step to getting a man on the moon was to send an astronaut around the Earth. NASA was going to need to hire more space experts and more people who were good at math. Really good. The people at the laboratory had to work together from morning to night to figure out how to send astronaut John Glenn into space and bring him back home to Earth safely. Captain Johnson knew she could use math to help. Tell me where you want the spaceship to land, and I'll tell you where to launch it, Catherine told her boss. Catherine helped calculate the traje trajectories or pathways that rockets travel through space. She had to plan Glenn's exact route from takeoff in Florida to splash down in the Atlantic Ocean. There was no room for error. No one was better than Catherine at solving these tricky math problems. Day before his mission, days before his mission, John Glenn wanted Catherine to double-check the machine computer's trajectory calculations to make sure it hadn't made any mistakes. When Catherine said the numbers were correct, Glenn was ready to go. On February 20th, 1962, Glenn blasted into, off into space, circled the Earth, and made his way home safely. Meanwhile, Laws began to change so that black and white students could go to school together. Blacks fought for the right to sit beside whites on buses and to drink from the same water fountains. At the laboratory, black and white computers started working together in the same offices, eating at the same lunch tables, and using the same bathrooms. Black and white moviegoers could sit next to each other in the same theater. Across the country, people started to think about ways to bring equality to all Americans. And that sounds really familiar. I mean, that's definitely thanks to Martin Luther King Jr. Christine Darden was good at math, and she loved electronic computers. She started working at Langley in, 16, in 1967. Christine wanted to become an engineer, and thanks to Dorothy, Mary, and Catherine, she knew it was possible. Eventually, she became an engineer for supersonic airplanes, planes flying faster than the speed of sound. But her first job was to help with NASA's mission to the moon. The people at the laboratory prepared for years to send astronauts to the moon, about 238,900 miles away from the Earth. Finally, on July 20th, 1969, the world watched as the three men arrived at the moon in their Apollo 11 spacecraft. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, said astronaut Neil Armstrong when he stepped onto the dusty surface. But it was also a giant leap for Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, Christine, and all of the other computers and engineers who had worked at the laboratory over the years. The moon landing was success from takeoff to splashdown, but there was no time to rest. Once NASA landed astronauts on the moon, the people at the laboratory began dreaming of sending humans to other planets such as Mars or Jupiter or Saturn. They started to imagine hyper-fast space planes that could travel around the world at seven times the speed of sound. The next adventure wouldn't be easy and would require lots of tests and lots more numbers. But Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, and Christine knew one thing. With hard work, perseverance, and a love of math, anything was possible. I've included our glossary just to help us 
understand what some of our words meant, like aeronautics, the study of flying. We have NASA, what that means, orbit, satellite, sonic boom, speed of sound, turbulence, and wind tunnel. Some of them, they were defined in the text right after the word. So that's, remember, always one way to look for words that we don't know what the meaning are meaning in context. But we can also look at our glossary and our words to know. And we also see that it's alphabetized. It's in ABC order. So that helps us to find things really quickly. So I hope you enjoyed our story of hidden figures. And one of the women that we read about is actually from Hampton, Virginia. And her name, if we remember, her name was Dorothy. That was Dorothy Vaughn. So she was actually from Hampton, which is just over the tunnel. So after this, I'm going to read some of the so little biographies on them at the end of the book, just as a little bonus, just to get to know the women a little bit more. So if you do not want to join me from after that, I hope you have a good night, sweet dreams, and I will see you in the morning. All right, so meet the computers. And remember, the computers are the people. They're not actual computers. That's what they called computers. But they were actually the women who did all the math, and then also the men as well. But remember, they didn't, they didn't think that women could do the same thing. So again, meets the computers. Dorothy Johnson Vaughn, 1910 to 2008. So that means she was born in 1910, and she died in 2008. Dorothy was born September 20, 1910, in Kansas City, Missouri. She and her family moved to West Virginia when she was eight. Dorothy received a full scholarship to Wilberforce University, a historical, historically black college in Ohio, where she graduated at age 19 with a degree in mathematics education. She married Howard Vaughn in 1932, and they had six children. So she graduated really early from college. Usually you graduate around 21, but she had 19, so she was really good at math. After college, Dorothy worked as a high school math teacher in Farmville, Virginia. In 1943, she began her job at Langley Memorial Aeronautic Aeronautical Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia. She worked as a mathematician and computer, later becoming NASA's first African-American supervisor. When machine computers were introduced at Langley, Dorothy learned the programming language for train and taught it to her staff. She died in 2008 at age 98. Mary Winston Jackson, born in 1921 and died in 2005. Mary was born in April 9, 1921 in Hampton, Virginia. Oh, so this is, sorry, I got them mixed up. So Mary was the one that was born in Hampton. She graduated with highest honors in the all-black Phoenix High School then graduated from Hampton Institute, which is now Hampton University, in 1942 with degrees in mathematics and physical science. She taught math in an all-black high school in Maryland for a year before taking a job as a bookkeeper back in her hometown. She married Levi Jackson Sr., and they had two children. Mary began work as a computer at Langley Memorial, Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory in 1951. She worked in a supersonic wind tunnel, studying the impact of wind forces that were nearly twice the speed of sound in order to promote to engineer. She needed to take graduate level courses in physics and math. She had to petition the city of Hampton, Virginia for permission to attend the classes because they were held at an all whites only high school. She completed the classes and in 1958, she became the first female African-American aerospace engineer at NASA. Late in her career, Mary took a position in NASA's Equal Opportunity Office, where she worked to support the careers of other women and minorities. She volunteered for more than 30 years as a Girl Scout leader. She died in 2005 at age 83. Catherine Coleman Gobble Johnson, she was born in 1918. She is still living. Catherine was born August 26, 1918 in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. Her community did not offer public school for African Americans after eighth grade, so her family arranged for her to t attend the high school run by West Virginia State Institute, 125 miles away. She completed high school at age 14 and went to West Virginia State College, graduating summa cum laude at age 18 with degrees in mathematics and French. In 1939, she married her first husband, Jimmy Gobble, and they had three children. Jimmy Gobble died of a brain tumor in 1956. 
Catherine married James Johnson in 1959. Catherine taught high school math before beginning work as a computer at Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia in 1953. Finally got that whole word or whole, <laughs> whole name right. Her expertise in analytical geometry carried her a place in the Flight Research Division. She worked on the flight trajectories, the flight paths for Project Mercury, the program that sent the first American astronauts into space. Astronaut John Glenn specifically requested that Catherine double-check the computer's calculations of his spacecraft's orbit around the Earth. She also contributed calculations to the 1969 Apollo 11 mission to the moon. And lastly, Dr. Christine Mann Darden, born 1952. She has not died. She is still living. Christine was born September 10, 1942, in Monroe, North Carolina. She had an early interest in understanding how things worked, and as a child, she repeatedly took apart and rebuilt her bicycle. She graduated as high school valedictorian in 1958. She went to Hampton Institute on a scholarship and graduated in 1962 with a degree in mathematics education. In 1963, she married Walter Jordan Jr. She had two children and briefly taught high school math. She earned a master's degree in aerosol physics in from Virginia State University. She earned her doc doctorate in mechanical engineering from George Washington University in 1973. In 1967, Christine Darden began working at Langley. She became an expert on sonic booms, the sound associated with shock waves created when an object travels through the air faster than the speed of sound. She designed a computer program that could stimulate, simulate sonic booms and helped improve designs for aircraft flying at supersonic speeds. Whew, I hope you learned a little bit about our four characters in our book, just a little bit better, got to know them. So again, this was a biography. So those listed all those different things about those different women and where they came from, where they studied, and what specific disciplines in math that they studied, whether it was physics, whether it was engineering, all those different things. So again, one more time. I hope you enjoyed our story, getting to know our characters just a little better in this bonus material, we'll call it. And you have a great evening. You have sweet dreams. And I will see you in the morning.